Today's scripture reading will be Psalms 106, verse 1. And it says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures, endures forever. Thank you, Jason, for the apt reading of his word. Uh, it's been a blessing so far in this service. Uh, Magda already preached my sermon. The music has been great. Jason already read the word. I feel like just saying amen and sitting down. Um, but I prepared a sermon, so I guess I'm going to preach it. I'm going to kneel down one more time. <clears throat> Lord God, speak to our hearts. Um, thank you so much for your word. Illuminate our minds once again. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. <clears throat> I am, too, uh, talking about the topic of gratitude and thankfulness. And um, I wanted to just look at the definition of the word gratitude with you. Gratitude apparently means the quality of being thankful. Readiness to show, to show appreciation for and to return kindness. Gratitude. Gratitude. Gratitude is a profound need in society. Probably one of the most underappreciated experiences in our society. Psalms, page one, Psalms chapter 118, verse 24 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is a day that the Lord has made. Every day is a day that the Lord has made. And therefore, every day includes reason to rejoice Amen. and be glad in it. Today, especially so on the Sabbath of the Lord. <clears throat> Magda already iterated this, um, but I'm going to say it again. Gratitude, they've done many different research uh, projects on the topic of gratitude. And they have found that, found that gratitude is strongly and consistently linked with all of these things. Greater happiness, feeling more positive emotions, relishing good experiences, improved health, dealing with adversity, and building strong relationships. Now, who does not want all of those things? <laughs> those are all the things that we long for in life. Strong relationships, happiness, positive emotions, good health. You want more of all of those things, the avenue seems to be gratitude for improving and greater improving those things. <clears throat> In fact, that could be why the Bible repeatedly calls us to gratitude. Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. <laughs> and be thankful. We all know that we should be thankful. The hard part about thankfulness and gratitude is when things are going poorly. <laughs> but God does not teach this idea that we have the freedom to be ungrateful <laughs> when things are not going our way. In fact, if you continue reading, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, Paul again says, rejoice always. Rejoice always. How often? Always. That doesn't mean when things are only good. <laughs> the very next verse goes on to say, give thanks in all circumstances. <laughs> for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I love the fact that our nation has a holiday called Thanksgiving. <laughs> It's such a beautiful holiday, a holiday that your only job responsibility is to make food, eat food, and be thankful. <laughs> you don't have to worry about gifts. You don't have to worry about who's the place of honor, because really, the person in the place of honor in Thanksgiving is God himself, <laughs> because he is the one that we're praising, God, thank you for everything good, and thank you for the challenges, too, because through them, we grow. 
There was a man named George, George Mueller. I'm sure you've heard that name before. George Mueller operated multiple orphanages in the 1800s. And, and, and this was a time where there was not uh, an official tax process to support those who didn't have parents. The orphanage was just run based on random uh, acts of kindness, and uh, it was run based on different people who, who, who made offerings to it. George Mueller never once went and asked for money to run his orphanages. All he did is pray, and people came to him and offered money and goods. One day, it was a particularly scary and perilous circumstance. Um, George Mueller had a, a house full of orphanages. I mean, an orphanage full of orphans, and it was time to eat, and there was no food, none. They had eaten everything in the home. And so they went to George Mueller, and they said, what are we going to do? There's no food to put on the table. And he says, sit the kids at the table and have the blessing. Of course, the uh, kitchen staff and helpers thought, this is ridiculous. How can you put the kids at the table? There's no food to give them. So he brings the kids to the table. They set them down. George Mueller opens his hands in gratitude and says, Lord God, thank you for the food that you have provided. As he's praying, a knock on the door. The baker comes to the door, lets him know that the night before, God had impressed him to give a large portion of bread to the orphanage. And there he was to deliver it. <laughs> as, the, as the baker finished bringing all the bread, setting it down on the table, as, just as he was walking out, another knock on the door. The milkman let George Mueller know that his truck had broken down. He couldn't finish the rest of his deliveries, and he didn't want the milk to be wasted, and he's donating the rest of it to the orphanage. Amen. You read some of the stories that George Mueller tells they're all like this. They're just like phenomenal stories. But the, thought, the thing that, that, that got me most about the story is that George Mueller gave thanks when it didn't see, seem like there was something to give thanks for yet. And, and this, is a, this is probably the most important key idea of the entire sermon. We give thanks always. <laughs> we give thanks always. Whether it looks like we have reason to give thanks or not, we give thanks. In all circumstances, God says. I mean, you look at the story of Job. Job was the richest man on the earth. <laughs> Job had a wonderful family. But one thing after another, Job lost. He lost his property. He lost his children. He even lost his health. Of all things he was left with, it was left with bad he was left with a wife who said to him, curse God and die. And he was left with friends that sat there and blamed him for all the problems that he had. Those things which he was left with only hurt him more. And if anybody had a reason to, quote, curse God and die, certainly it seems as if Job did. But yet that's not what Job says. In fact, Job, in Job chapter 1 verse 21, says the words, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. But then he finishes with, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. He says, I will praise God no matter what. I don't care what the circumstances, I will praise God. I will thank him, I will give gratitude, because God is good, even if the circumstances are not. There's a book called The Hiding Place, written by Corey Ten Boom. If you've ever written it, it's amazing. If you haven't read that book, you should get it. I mean, it's just profound. Corey Ten Boom uh, lived during the Nazi regime. <clears throat> she was known for harboring Jews, and eventually found herself wound up in one of the most horrible concentration camps, Ravensbrück. Her sister and her were both in the same concentration camp, and... Uh, and the sister Betsy was saying, um, we 
need to be thankful in spite of the circumstance. One of the things that was bothering them so badly is the barracks that they were forced to live in in this concentration camp was utterly filled with fleas. It was a disgusting place. They were practically starving daily. They were constantly in fear of being abused. And, and, and it was at the breaking point when they realized that they would have to live in a, a flea infestation. When Corey was about ready to say, I can't handle this anymore, Betsy said, we need to kneel down and thank God for everything. Corey said, what do you mean thank God for everything? We live in fleas. And she said, then we will kneel down and we will thank God for the fleas. Corey, struggling with that for a little bit, finally decided that they would kneel down and thank God for fleas. It was not too long afterwards that they realized that the, the, the guards which constantly molested and abused them were no, no longer wanting to have anything to do with them and their barracks. And they realized something, that it was because of the fleas. It was the fleas which kept them safe and allowed them to actually have Bible studies with the other people there. And it was the fleas which gave them a, save, a haven of safety. And so they continued to remember to kneel down and thank God for fleas. Amen. In a very real sense, it's true that the struggle ends when the gratitude begins. It, it may sound like a fun little saying, but it really is the truth. And a lot of people talk about happiness. And the reality is that happiness comes and goes with whatever the circumstances are. If, uh, I, I remember, <clears throat> I remember uh, going, wanting to go to Disneyland when I was a little kid. And you know the, the uh, advertisement for Disneyland or Disney World? What's the advertisement? At least it was when I was a kid, I don't know. But they advertise it as the happiest place on earth. And I thought, that's where I want to go. I need to go to the happiest place on earth. The reality is, what that teaches you is that if you're not at Disneyland, you're not at the happiest place. You can't be happy. But what gratitude teaches is the idea that no matter what's going on, you can be thankful. You can be thankful. If you find it hard to be grateful in the present, the Bible teaches, then look to the future. Because God has promised us many beautiful things. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the Lord, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have everything to look forward to. And if there's a moment, if you happen to be in that, that place in life where everything isn't perfect... <laughs> where things are a little bit frustrating, where work isn't going right and the relationships just don't seem to be flowing, the very least you can say is, I have something to look forward to. God has promised that someday all of this will be taken care of. That doesn't mean that you can't cry. It doesn't mean that you can't grieve or, or, or get through the hardship. You're allowed to sh share emotion and, and to feel sadness and hurt, but God says in the end, he will take care of it all. In fact, God says, if things are going good, be grateful. And if things are going bad, be grateful. There was a um, church that was going through a building project. Sounds similar because we're about ready to vote on an upcoming building project. Uh, about towards the end of January, we're going to have a, our final business meeting for the building project, which we hope all of you will be present at because we're going to be uh, making a vote uh, whether to move forward with the building project or not. There was a, a church that had, um, fin was doing a building project, and this was right about the time of World War II. There were two families, and, and the church, uh, they were making appeals for people to think about what they could give and for this building project. And um, as the families were leaving the church, they were all kind of pondering this idea. And one of the families came to the pastors. They were coming out, and, and they said to the pastor, Pastor, you know that our son was killed in the war. And as a, as a memorial offering in, in his memory, we'd like to give to the building project. And that was in World War II, so they said $200. Nowadays, that'd be more like $2,000 or whatever. But um, the, the family, the couple behind them, was also thinking about what they could offer. And, and they said, wow, that, 
that family gave $200 for their son who died. <laughs> they said, Pastor, my wife and I were talking about giving $200 for the building project, uh, and, and they gave $200 when their son died. We were going to give $200, but our son came back from the war alive. And for that, we will give $500. And you see, the whole idea is, the context is, both of them were giving. Both of them were praising God and saying, I want God's work to go forward, regardless of the circumstances. Regardless of the circumstances. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, We also thank God constantly for this. That when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. God, here Paul is saying that they frequently are, or constantly are being thankful. One of you, uh, somebody here may be saying, okay, I get it. You're telling me to be thankful, to be, to be gracious, to, be, to have gratitude. And I know that I need to, but I just, I'm struggling with it. And don't raise your hand, but maybe there's someone here feeling that way, struggling with having more gratitude. You may be wondering, how can I increase gratitude? I'd like to show you this passage from Psalms 143, verse 5. It's simple. It says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done for me, or all that you have done, and I ponder the works of your hands. I think one of the reasons that we have struggle being grateful is simply because we don't stop and choose to be intentionally grateful. Here he says that he stopped to meditate on the things that God had done. Had he not stopped to meditate on the things that God had done, perhaps he wouldn't have been so grateful for them. Gratitude takes intentionality. It takes a willingness to say, I choose to pause and be thankful. I choose to make this my mindset. And so I encourage each of us to meditate on what God has done for you today. The Bible talks about lots of things that are going to happen in the last days. And it's interesting, in numerous places, Paul lists the characteristics of people living in the last days. Uh, Jesus said, in the last days, it'll be like the days of Noah. But I want you to notice one of the things that's character characteristically on that list. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-2. through 2. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, and unholy. You notice what is on the list? Being ungrateful is on the list. Of all the things, and notice what it starts off with. Lovers of selves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents. I'd like to suggest that if gratefulness was on the list, many of the others would not be. They could not be. Why? Because gratefulness changes the personality and, and, and how you choose to behave. It is, it is the ungrateful heart that wants to spitefully get, get back at somebody. It is the ungrateful heart that wants to steal and take for themselves. It is the ungrateful heart that continues to create conflict in circumstances. The grateful heart says, I'm content and I'm okay anyway. It's a signs of the times that ungratefulness abounds. <laughs> and it's also a sign of those who are not right with God. There was a young woman named Anne Steele. And she had encountered in her life one trial after another. She had her mother die when she was only three years old. And so she... Shortly after, um, when she was 19, she suffered a hip injury that left her as an invalid. She couldn't walk anymore, and she had to be pushed in a wheelchair. Eventually, she was able to find a man and fall in love, even in her current circumstance. She found a, a man that loved her for who she was, and, and they were going to be married. It was actually on her wedding day that her fiancé drowned. 
Anne Steele was famous for writing uh, many beautiful hymns. And in her moment of absolute pain, realizing that those few things that she thought would bring her joy was removed from her life, she wrote this. Father, whatever of earthly bliss thy sovereign will denies, Accepted at thy throne of grace, let this petition rise. Give me a calm and thankful heart from every murmur free. The blessing of thy grace impart and make me live for thee. Hey, if Anne Steele could say that in her circumstance, then I can be thankful too. To choose not to murmur, (laughs) Not to complain, not to harbor resentment, but to be gracious and thankful for what God has given. As Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says, give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks. So my appeal is simple and straightforward. I challenge you to find something to be grateful for. I challenge you to find something to be grateful for, no matter what the circumstance of your life currently is. With that, let us sing our closing hymn. Please stand. Hymn number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
we have the privilege to escape the dangers of resentment <laughs> through gratitude. But it's a choice. We have to choose to be thankful. Let's praise God, shall we? Lord God, you're worthy of all praise. You said that you're the one, the father of lights, where all good gifts come from. And certainly you're worthy to be praised. Lord, thank you for the simple things. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for the health that we do have. Thank you for the families that we have. Thank you for the church family. Thank you for all the infinite blessings that, would, that we could go on naming forever and ever here together. We choose to be thankful. We choose to praise you and to thank you for what you have given us. And for the rest, we leave in your hands, trusting that someday you'll make it right, if not on this earth, in the next. We ask all these things and we praise you in the name of your dear son, Jesus Christ. Amen.